Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Are there legitimate educational opportunities in the paranormal field? Are some psychiatric patients actually experiencing paranormal events? What do quantum mechanics and the multiverse theory do to religion? Well, uh, I'm going to take Ben's lines here because we have a little bit of an audio problem with our co-host. Uh, anyway, welcome to the 910th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Coming to you from WOON 1240 AM and 99.5 FM in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. On the Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. On YouTube and via TuneIn.com. Uh, there we go. Well, today we bring you an open line show and one of our favorite guest co-hosts as soon as we can get his audio going here. Uh, as Hurricane Ida, a vicious storm, is ready to make landfall on the Gulf Coast, uh, we send our prayers and best thoughts to the people there. That includes today's scheduled guest, Dr. Jeff Long of Huma, Louisiana, uh, whom we understand was part of a mandatory evacuation yesterday and obviously has had to reschedule his appearance with us. Uh, Jeff is an expert in near-death experiences, something I was looking very forward to, to talking about, but we'll, we'll get him back in the fall. Today, we also remember the victims of the myriad other disasters being afflicted upon the world right now, including the floods in Tennessee and the catastrophe in Afghanistan. So in a pinch, we bring you an open-line show with our wonderful cousin and frequent guest co-host, Rick Eno. Okay, uh, Rick is interested in all areas of the paranormal, uh, he is a certified investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, and has been our show's Northern California reporter for several years. He lives with his lovely family in the San Francisco area. So we'll welcome him to the show as soon as we can get him back on here. So let's uh, we'll start with our questions here as Ben is working on that. We have a, uh, a question from uh, Izzy in Connecticut. And Izzy writes, I find myself completely fascinated by your work and are eager to learn more and get involved. Do you offer any educational opportunities, apprenticeships, research, interning, etc., for budding paranormal researchers like myself? Uh, I'm a Connecticut resident and have a BA in psychology with a concentration in the psychology of religion. Please feel free to recommend readings or lectures that might further my knowledge. Any suggestions are appreciated. Uh, well, Izzy, uh, we do not, uh, we often get that uh, question whether we offer uh, any sorts of um, presentation. Well, we do. I mean, if, if you look at our web uh, site, the behindtheparanormal.com, there is a Paul and Ben's public appearance page, and uh, you can see where we're speaking at any given time. Uh, there's more in-person stuff than than there was obviously last year, uh, and there's many much of it that's on done online via Zoom or some other thing like that. So we have that. Uh, we have considered offering seminars, online seminars, things of that kind, uh, even in times that are not uh, pandemic, uh, when nothing like that is going on. It can be very uh, good to do online events because people from Zimbabwe or Hawaii or anywhere can uh, participate without having to pay a you know, humongous amount of money for a plane ticket. So we, we, um, we're considering offering something in that line. Uh, for uh, a, a while I was um, offering a course uh, or two at the uh, International Metaphysical University, which was run by some friends of ours. Um, I, I don't know if that's still functioning. Uh, I should know, but I don't. So um, there, there is that. Uh, there is the issue of... Um, the legitimacy of what you would learn at such a thing, if it's taught by someone who really doesn't know what they're doing. Rick, do we have you? The ah, then it is on your end, not my end. Okay. Now we know. Please continue, Father. Okay. Uh, there is uh, Adler University, uh, which offers um, uh, some courses in parapsychology. They, I think I did some research on that. There used to be more. Uh, at legitimate academic institutions, uh, accredited institutions that offered uh, some courses in uh, parapsychology and even degrees in it. Uh, there was John F. Kennedy University in uh, California, and uh, friends of mine actually earned parapsychology degrees there, including uh, Keith Harari, who was um, 
I kind of uh, consulted with a bit after the Bridgeport case in 1974 and uh, this sort of thing. So, But there, uh, today there don't seem to be that many. Uh, beware of online institutions, which may really not be accredited. Uh, if you might say what you want about accredited institutions, you know, that means that they've been accredited by the local or state uh, or regional association of colleges and secondary schools that, that they uh, can grant legitimate degrees and that they have uh, teachers who actually supposedly know what they're doing. That may or may not be the case, but at least there is some discipline uh, in the thinking and in, in and some quality control and that sort of thing. It's, the accredited institu- institutions are the best you can do. Uh, beware of online self-appointed experts. Okay. So all that being said, uh, I'm afraid the um, uh, opportunities in the academic realm for the paranormal education, as it were, uh, is are, are rather slim. Uh, there is something, however, that you might want to look at, and that's transpersonal psychology. Uh, there uh, are more opportunities in that field, and it does sort of touch on paranormal uh, experience to some degree. It, it acknowledges the existence of spirituality, and it is um, considered uh, a little bit out there, but legitimate by uh, those in psychology. Bear in mind, too, that science is uh, – scientists – as a rule, tend not to talk to each other. Science is still not as interdisciplinary as it should be. Uh, in other words, you can have people who are in behavioral science who don't talk to people who are physicists of consciousness, For just for example. Uh, within the realm of cosmology and astronomy, yes, there, there is a lot going on. But within, within the realm of the uh, the sciences of that kind, uh, psychology, etc., cetera, uh, it's not really, um, uh, there isn't a lot of dialogue. So, so it's all over the place. Uh, and I would just say, um, take the opportunities as, as they come, but judge them very, very strictly. Um, so it, I, I'm afraid it's not a very positive answer on that. It's, it's, it's difficult. Third it time's would, the charm, Rick. Does it work? I think we got it. Oh, we, whoa, we wow. got Okay. When in, when in doubt, switch devices. Uh, and, uh, yeah, look at that. Radio, live radio, folks. Right, now I can stop yakking. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, Rick, you're in California. Welcome to the show. Back to Thank the show. You. And uh, I don't know if uh, – is are you aware of any institutions that that, that uh, have courses in paranormal subjects or grant degrees, as they say, like John F. Kennedy Uni- University used to? Um, I'm not aware of – I know there are conferences you can go to. I do know that there is a university out there, an academic university – who and I have to remember which one, and I can I can dig back and try to find it. That's I, I actually doing a degree uh, in ufology. Um, really? But I, yeah, I heard about that a couple of months ago and kind of fell off my chair. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, I'll uh, look back and try to find. Yeah, check where it out that. next time around and let us know. One one of the but the problems is you know you, you can have a, a fully accredited degree from a fully accredited university in this subject that might still be nonsense. I mean, if, yeah. they, if they take, you know, 18th century points of view on, on ghosts and all this stuff or whatever, uh, but I, but that, I, in an accredited institution, I would not expect that to be the norm. Uh, they would be concerned with data and, uh, things of this kind, I think, that are important and legitimate and, and bringing a little bit of disciplined thinking to this. So if you do yeah. run into anything, let us know and we'll pass it on to Izzy and all the rest of the listeners. Yeah, and one thing on it, as uh, when I remember hearing about it, it was exactly as you just said. It was more about the investigation and the history. Yeah. So how it and what the actual history is. And the problem with that is, Paul, as you know, is if you don't have the right people teaching the history, you're going to get a slanted view. So Yeah, yeah. Well, the history is very interesting, and it um, that would be something that people would be interested in as well. You know, that would be something we, we don't do a show on, the history of the paranormal at some point. Yeah. History of paranormal actually- research. Didn't think of that. Okay, Ben, if you are available now, uh, we have a very, very brief question from Leanne in Creston, Iowa. Yes, I I am available now. Your favorite short question. Which is great. Uh, So Leanne writes, if reincarnation is true, why are there so many ghosts? (laughs) I've asked that question myself a number of times. Very good question, uh, Leanne. Uh, The... The whole idea of reincarnation, of course, if anybody doesn't know, uh, is that you die and you are reincarnated uh, from the Latin for, for you know, taking flesh again. 
uh, into someone else. Uh, extremists would say you could become something else, you know, a horse or a gnat or a newt or something. Uh, and there are, there are various points of view on that. Uh, oddly enough, uh, Judaism and Christianity had a brief tradition of belief in reincarnation. There were a number, uh, the origin, uh, not, not meaning the beginning, but he was a guy, uh, in North Africa, origin, O-R-I-G-E-N, mm. was an early, uh, <clears throat> Christian theologian who believed in reincarnation. Mm. He was considered a heretic later on. He also believed that, uh, when the, when the resurrected came back, they would have spherical bodies. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Yeah, he must have known about orbs, mm. but <clears throat> early photographer. But in any case, uh, there there are um, some traditions of that. However, uh, with modern quantum physics, which has put the uh, kibosh on a lot of uh, standard, ordinary three dimensional beliefs, the uh, time essentially does not really exist that way. Uh, even Einstein's special theory of relativity goes into uh, time being uh, simultaneous. And the past and future are just functions of our consciousness. We just experience it that way. It has no real objective reality. So uh, that does wonders for the idea of dying and coming back because there's nothing, you know, there's no past. How can you have past lives? So, uh, but the question remains. I mean, so uh, in our belief, you have parallel lives because of the time thing, and that's how you get the reincarnation memories and all this other stuff. Uh, of course, the, so but that also would explain the problem of uh, traditional reincarnation and being so many ghosts, because uh, one would not affect the other if there's no simultaneous time. You would have a, uh, <coughs> a simultaneous uh, many many lives being lived at the same time, <coughs> which uh, would be uh, a way to explain our memories and and imagination and various uh, identities with other people and, and other times, things of that kind, <clears throat> and um, the, with ghosts being not dead people, but people being seen in real parallel worlds where they didn't die, might have died here but not there, uh, other facets of themselves, that would pretty much take care of that problem in my opinion. I don't know, uh, Ben and then Rick? Uh, yeah, sure, um, let's, uh, let's let's just jump, jump right into the whole reincarnation thing. I guess... Um, I think I think it's uh, it's one of those one of those things of, of understanding. Yeah, it's um, I, I think that we have English is just awful. It's it, every time I try to talk about yeah, any, I make a living with English. Go easy. No, I mean not Tay. Hey, you know, it's one thing to talk about building codes because that makes <laughs> sense in English. But when you're trying to talk about like anything that's like existential or anything that's beyond. You know the mundane. It's it's incredibly hard to articulate anything, mostly because I'm going to toss this out, this this little little grenade out there, that um, I think it's because our language has evolved around bringing things down to our level. Um, that you know, in order to understand you know the world around us, which you know we view as as lovely, you know, you know this is empirical materialism here. That like okay well I know that this table is a table because it's made up of table stuff and I can touch it I can I can smell it if I want to I can taste it it'll probably not taste very good but I will look at it and say that is a table but it's it's um it's un these these concepts just don't translate well into English because there's just no concept of of something beyond yourself right you know I I remember there was a fun fact that I heard a long time ago. Um, that we use the the personal pronoun for ourself more than any other language in the world, and it's like you know we which you can kind of see in social media. It's like um, Marion said this really funny thing today that was like you know we feel the need to to insert our opinion all the time when it's not asked for or <laughs> or wanted, and and it's and it's because we we've developed this culture around I, and unfortunately we all participate in it. Whether we like it or not, you know, it's like I hate it, but I do it all the time, and I'm even saying it right now. But the idea of of, of reincarnation, especially in the in the sense that it translated into English, is just it's just bonkers and off the wall, and just doesn't make a ton of sense. It's um, it's it's like you know the the sort of from what I understand from from you know 
study studying different different you know philosophies and thoughts it's a continuation of 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 existence not of the self but of like you know you're it's it's just a continuing right you know what you know it's like in 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 hinduism it's like you know the whole goal is to break out of the cycle of reincarnation and yeah you know, it's kind of the same in buddhism um the goal is to break out of it because being stuck in it is a bad thing mm. whereas in the west it's like you know it's a good thing cuz i get to be me forever right 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 um because you know the, the concept just doesn't translate you know i've i've had i've i've had to explain that to a lot of people who are like yeah you know you're just like a reincarnated soul and whatever and it's like well i don't want to do that if if we're following the strict definition of it if we're going from you know hinduism and buddhism um correct me if i'm wrong anybody it's like no, it's not good. I don't want that, right? You know, if I do a whole bunch of bad stuff, then karma will come back and be like, well, I guess you're just going to be an ant, and uh, <laughs> you're – sorry. Sorry, bud. Um, yeah, it's, it's, <coughs> you don't, do... don't run into your mother. Your mother hates ants. That's true. I mean, I'm not, ah, they're interesting. Anyway, but it's 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 this concept of, of a continuation and um, that, that's, that you can even see in, like, you know, Second Temple Judaism. Right, you know, which kind of translates into why people pick certain names for their kids. You know, everybody kind of forgets. You know, like um, uh, I forget what what Westerners call it, confirmation names. Yeah, is that a thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. where it's it's like um, you know, the whole point is that you carry on the name of this person that did something great, so that you can bring honor to said name or person, right? Because you essentially become an extension of that same identity, right? You know, it's like. Um, uh, uh, excuse me. It's it, it's this idea of a continuation of being a bigger part of something that I think we're missing in this whole idea of reincarnation. Mm. And um, you know, it's like if we're going to go biblical, right? You know, if we're throwing that throwing that out there, peop, you know, it's like uh, someone asked, like, oh, well, if the end was coming to Christ, then Elijah would come, and he's like, well, he did. You just didn't you just didn't pay attention. Which yeah, you know, some would reference it to you know Saint John the Baptist, right? And, um, you know, it's not like he's the same person, but it's a continuation of that, of that idea, that identity. And because it's all kind of part of the same thing, right? You know, there's no mention of time, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, I'm reincarnated of this guy from 1812, you know, the gold, the golden age, and he was, you know, whatever. It's like, it's a continuation of that existence of a, of a something bigger than ourselves. Well, mm-hmm. we got Rick's audio going. We should let him say something. Yeah, uh, sorry, Rick. What <clears throat> what say you about reincarnation, Rick? Well, uh, man, that was not a grenade. That was more of a mortar shell uh, in the center. Uh, that was really... Um, <clears throat> I'll just say this. Um, the you know, pagans believe that when you die, uh, you, your body would be burned uh, in the Vikings, for example, and that would free your soul. And, you know, Christians believe that your soul... And your body are one, and that makes you you. So uh, the second coming, um, you and your body to be you will be renewed, and you'll have a new body. And so when it comes to reincarnation, um, it, it, just as Ben said, it, we don't really have a lot of words to describe it. But when it comes to reincarnation, um, there's some things that's hard to uh, cross over, particularly if you believe in the multiverse, Um and then how would that work? Is it a shared soul across the multiverse with, with, uh, with different variations of you? Um, so when it comes to reincarnation, I, I honestly am in the camp of, I honestly don't understand it enough, uh, not, not just from reading about it and understanding it from a textual s- standpoint and how it's, how it's uh, talked about, but how it would actually work and why, it would, why would it work that way. So um, my jury's out on it. However, I, I have... A feeling that reincarnation, as you know, coming back as an ant or an aardvark, uh, isn't isn't the way it works. I just have that innate feeling. I don't know what what sparks that, but it just doesn't seem to be the way that that works. Okay, well, before we move on to the next question, I'm going to defend uh, the English language, the source of my income, uh, <clears throat> a little bit by saying that there are over three million words in English, very few of which are used. That's a good point. You can carry on conversations that most people do. Entirely with cliches that mean nothing, you know. Now, the other day, there was a friend of mine who was having a birthday, and I wished her an auspicious anniversary of her geniture. And uh, everybody was all boggled and everything falling out of their chairs. And, and uh, I think that if we used more words in English, like perhaps it, the situation Ben described might improve. 
hmm. we might be able to uh, to approach uh, more fully at least some of the paranormal or theological or whatever concepts that that, that are pretty uh, pretty slippery. But that being said, uh, I don't expect everybody to be absorbing the di- the uh, full dictionary anytime soon. So we'll we'll go to the next question. Ah, but then is language uh, informed by culture? Well, this is true, and heaven help us. All right, well, here we are. Uh, th- these are two questions from our dear friend Peter in Bogota, Colombia, and mm-hmm. they are meant for Rick. Yes, mm-hmm. for you, Rick. Yeah, Rick, now you're you in can... the spotlight. Yes, indeed. Now that we, now that we have everything functioning, um, so. Uh, our, our good friend Peter writes to us, what are the most mysterious UFO cases in Northern California that you are aware of? Oh, goodness. Um, this is domain, so. Yeah, so there, there's many buckets to that. And I think uh, I'll, I'll give an answer here, but I'm back on the 12th. This is kind of impromptu, but I'm back on the 12th, and I'll give some really, really good examples and to direct you to some sites. But I will say this, that in terms of what you call the nuts and bolts UFOs, so to speak, um, the one that was the most mysterious to me, and usually I don't lean on video. Usually it's the, the reports and what the person is saying. Can they redraw it? But I saw a, a, a video which uh, seems to be very legitimate, especially where it was, and I'll explain that. It was in the Bay Area, and it was of a craft of a pretty large size, um, sort of following the edge of the bay on the East Bay side, clearly taken from a guy who is uh, in shock in his car looking at it, following it. And um, and you, when you're looking at it, typically in a video, you know, it, especially in the digital age, like this could be doctored, this could be this, this could be that. But the investigator who did the case verified everything, and that, that investigator, I believe, was Dev Rung, uh, Rooney. So... There's no question there. Uh, it, it made me step back and, because I'd never seen a visual that pronounced and clear of something traveling down the bay that was actually uh, investigated by us in California that well. I'm sure there's those out there, and I, I'll find those. That case just kind of um, set me back on my heels because I don't typically buy into the video. I don't typically buy into it, but this one was just real. In fact, uh I'll try to locate the video and get it get it up to you. Actually, I, I think I know where it is. Might okay. even be on my Instagram, yeah. probably. No. All right. So th- there's that one, and then I'll leave the rest of that question. I think I'm back on the 12th ball, and I'll bring in some of those cases. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think Ben walked off with the rest of Peter's question. Uh, we'll get back to those in, in a minute. Um, okay. Actually, yeah, do you have the you have the questions too, Rick? Yeah. We said. Okay. Well, what's so, Peter's second question? Peter's second question, actually, is a very interesting one. The subject of earth lights seems to keep occurring as an explanation for sightings. Please explain your understanding of this phenomenon and the varieties in visual and movement characteristics. Okay, so earth lights, basically, um, it's a reflection from the earth of light, and that can be taking place by sunlight, moonlight, volcanic tectonic activity that reflects back out from the earth. So, what happens is, in the phenomena, um, for an easier explanation, if it's reflecting off of a cloud, uh, reflecting off of um, any objects in the air, including the moon, I guess, um, what that can do is uh, project some type of uh, shadow that will seem to have contours. Um, a lot of the time with Earth lights, uh, they will be produced in different colors, um, they'll have different shapes, the most common being the basketball size shape, the orange orb. Um, and basically, they'll, they'll have movement. They'll move anywhere from very slowly to very, very high speeds. Um, there's something that has been occurring for a very, very long time. It's actually the history of Earth lights. Uh, they used to be called ghost lights. And this is really kind of fascinating if you, if you read about it over time because it's it's the, it appears to be the same event happening over and over again with a little bit different spin every generation or so. Um, in terms of uh, Peter's questions about um, the movements and the varieties, I think I've answered that. But I will say that um, they're uncommon. It's not – I know it's popping up more and more. People are saying earth lights. But up until the very recent times, as I've known it, uh, they're, they're, it's a very rare event. It's not something that happens every week, uh, but I do think that uh, people searching for an explanation will 
we'll go after those. Um, you know, I'm sure that in Iceland, when the volcano erupted and there was open earth and there was va- lava and light coming out, I'm sure there was probably uh, some earth light activity happening there. Or if the moonlight's coming down as the moon's changing phase and is being reflected back and it's a cloudy night or I mean, who knows, maybe even a satellite or another body up there, you could, you could see something like that. Um, but as why it's becoming more common, my only belief for that is is that uh, people are searching for an explanation because it, it's known as a rare event. Yeah, it's funny. Ben and I were in Iceland two years after that eruption, and oh, yeah, and it shut down. And anyway, we, we didn't see any lights, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's take our bottom of the hour break, and you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno and uh, special guest uh, co-host Rick Eno, our dear cousin and expert in the field, uh, on WON 1240 AM, 99.5 FM in New England's Blackstone River Valley, and we'll be right back. The night is alive. Join us and take a walk on the weird side when you tune in to the Kingdom of Nye, hosted by Heather Wade, the finest in late night talk. Listen live free weeknights starting at 9 p.m. Pacific time at thekingdomofnigh.com, talkstreamlive.com, and the Paranormal Radio app. Want to take a ride? Local and live at 99.5 FM. And welcome back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno and Rick Eno today as well, our special guest co-host. We're doing open lines on WOON 1240 AM and 99.5 FM. And let's continue. Now, we were talking about uh, responding to a question about earth lights mm. and a uh, question, you know, what, what does that mean to, you know, tectonic, uh, seismic, this sort of thing. Uh, there was some speculation that the, uh, the lights, uh, seen in the sky that are often interpreted as UFOs in seismic areas could be, uh, simply the result of the, si- of, the of the plates shifting. This has been duplicated somewhat in, in laboratories, seismic laboratories. However, uh, the lights only last for a split second. They're like flashes. So to have something that's doing strange maneuvers and coming close to the ground and you know, zipping off into space, uh, that has never been duplicated and probably is not the result of any sort of seismic activity. So that being said, um, Ben, did you have uh, any comment on the earth light uh, question? I actually don't know a ton about them. Um, yeah. So it's it, this has actually been very educational for me. Good, uh, yeah, but yeah. it does actually coincidentally lead into a uh, another, another listener question we have from Ray here in our listening area in one socket, um, which is your show with Lind- or your shows with Linda Zimmerman are really interesting. She has talked about UFOs actually going into and coming out of the ground. Uh, have you guys ever heard of any other cases of that, and how does that work? I can't think of a more perfect question. <laughs> I know. Yeah, look, <laughs> follow that look, other one. Look at that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've done the, the shows with with Linda, who is um, a good friend of ours, and is becoming very well known in the in the uh, UFO fields. He's been on more and more television uh, documentaries about this subject, and she lives in the Hudson Valley mm. uh, of the <laughs> state of New York, uh, and which is uh, has really kind of met up with our Litchfield, Goshen, uh, Torrington, Connecticut triangle. Because we pushed that out to about 330 square miles at this point, and it's gone into the Hudson Valley. So our area of research is, has linked up with Linda's. And uh, the Hudson Valley of New York is very, very well known for UFO activity, including UFOs that have been seen coming out of the ground and going back into the ground. Now, what's that about? And the, it, this links right up with the question of Earth lights. Are these UFOs in the sense of any kind of craft or intelligently controlled lights or whatever? Or is it something else? I don't know. Rick, any thoughts on that? Um, as far as the ground goes, um, I, I, have, I haven't heard of the ground, per se. I've heard of the median water going in and out of water, even without splashes, and some with splashes, but I haven't heard the ground. But it would make sense to me that if they can enter the water without making any splash, if they can uh, sort of pop in and pop out, then maybe... Uh, there is a way they can enter the ground by uh, just traveling through the ground in some some dimensional way to get to wherever whatever's underneath it. So it makes sense to me, but I haven't actually heard of a, a case of that. But I, I'm sure it's out there. I don't know at all. But well, sure there are. Th- th- this is where it might meet up with with uh, I guess what could be called earth lights uh, or spook lights, phantom lights, that sort of thing. Uh, there is uh, Brown Mountain in North Carolina. Now I've been there. 
but I did not really see any like, the, the things that might have been light, but I really couldn't be sure. Uh, it's it's uh, a uh, park area, so it's public land, and uh, but there have been some remarkable videos taken by people I know of these lights. Uh, initially, the, the natives considered it uh, to be the spirits of their ancestors, and uh, you know, spirits always enter into this somewhere. Uh, there are other areas of the world, and certainly in the United States, and particularly there's a particular cemetery in Arizona where these lights take place. So naturally, everybody assumes that they're ghosts. But uh, <clears throat> I think there have been some studies. Uh, Vincent, I think it was Gaddis, G-A-D-D-I-S, uh, wrote a very book, a very very good book, a mysterious. Um, I, uh, some, I, I, I don't like to speculate on the air, but it's, uh, look, look for Gaddis and Mysterious and you'll find the book, where, uh, which I think uh, it was written some, some years ago, but it is a very good treatment of this subject and he uh, gets into uh, where these things take place. But it, it is common and these things do come out of the ground and go into the ground, uh, which um, raises, it sort of would, would call for a broader definition of them being you know, extraterrestrial spacecraft. Now, who knows? Uh, coming into the ground and going out of the ground uh, might uh, imply some sort of multiverse connection uh, because you have many reports of uh, quote-unquote ghosts, things of this kind, you know, coming through solid objects, coming through walls. Uh, and there are shamans with whom I've spoken uh, who say you could, if you knew how to do it, walk through solid walls because we're, we're mostly, as any... As any uh, uh, nuclear physicists would 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 tell you we are mostly empty space uh, between the molecules of our bodies. So uh, I've never seen that. I'd like to, and um, I think it's as much of a mystery as the Earth lights at this point and things coming <laughs> out of the ground. But it's been well witnessed in the Hudson Valley area. And next time we have Linda on, we, we can uh, really get into that in some more depth. Okay. So what's next, Ben? We get so. We have uh, a question from Tanya in Laconia, New Hampshire, uh, that is uh, a bit about poltergeists. And she writes, if a poltergeist case is untreated or treated by idiots... <laughs> <laughs> She's listened uh, to our show for a long time. I guess that's fair, yeah. Um, what can be the final result? Well, th- th- that's a good question. Uh, and I often wondered that early on when I was running into poltergeists. You know, what happens if nobody does anything about this? Uh, I, I came to think, and I could be wrong, I, can't, I came to think of the poltergeist phenomenon as a, a sort of step in the world of the parasite. In other words, parasites will start uh, by trying to rattle you, so you put out negative energy they can eat. All right, and parasites, for those who don't know, this is what I think folklore calls demons. Uh, their theology is not the same as ours unless it helps them. And I've seen this time and again from possession cases all the way down to poltergeist. So when when they, they start to do that, they start to gain strength, they'll move to another step. Uh, and this might be um, certainly uh, the, the poltergeist uh, phenomenon. where thing, What that means, poltergeist is a German word meaning uh, a spirit that thrashes about. And there'll be noises. There could be smells. Uh, occasionally, there are visual experiences which I have had and in the presence of other people uh, there, there will be knockings there will be objects that appear that, that move around mm. I have been struck rather violently uh, in, in a couple of cases with these things the um, next step beyond that, that that's usually where people will, will if they do seek help will will call help uh, when the stuff starts flying around and hitting you all right or just flying around you know fl- table floating in midair things of that kind and heaven help them if they call the wrong people, and most people are the wrong people. If they call clergy, clergy don't generally are not trained in this. Uh, many will just assume it's demons, and will come in and pray. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, in the cases I've been involved with, my first one was that big Bridgeport case from 1974 with Ed Lorraine Warren, and um, there was so much recognition gained by this thing because Ed called in the press. Uh, and we never got permission to do anything from an exorcism standpoint, not that that necessarily would have helped. It, it probably would have, but maybe not. It's just, it's a, it's a big question mark. But if it's untreated, I think it could lead to what is commonly called the possession phenomenon. Because one person seems to be the target 
of the parasites at any one time. In parapsychology, this person is known as the agent uh, in a case of RSPK, or recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. And uh, in this case, uh, in the Bridgeport case, it was uh, Marcy, the little girl who was 10 years old. Uh, but I've seen these things move on to other people if they can't get enough to eat from, the, in this case, it would have been the little girl. So uh, I think that, that there would be a step up, uh, perhaps beyond that if it's untreated, to uh, possibly a possession situation. And I dealt with those uh, assisting a priest 1973 and 74 at a psychiatric hospital in upstate New York. And uh, I just did not get the impression that the theology was good enough to explain what was actually happening here. These things are hungry, they're hostile, they want to eat, and they will do whatever they can to get it. And they do not care about you. All right, They will pretend to be sometimes uh, spirit guides or whatever they have to do to get to you. And I'm not saying that all those things are necessarily parasitical. I don't think they are. But parasites will be mimics. They're part of nature, and they'll mimic this. So I think that it could lead to the possession phenomenon, uh, which could go on for years. People have attachments. Uh, these people are the hosts for these parasites. So I think if untreated, uh, I cannot see a good outcome to it, uh, there have been cases where these things have been untreated and have just gotten enough to eat and gone to greener pastures. It disp- depends on the species of the parasite. Uh, so I don't know, if anybody, I, I probably have more experience than, than most people with this, but Rick, what do you think? Well, I actually have a question, Paul. It, it's along the same lines, and it's about your, your case. I remember it from reading it about your Bridgeport case, um, and you were talking about floating objects. And, and my, um, my question is... <clears throat> When that happens, when the refrigerator levitates or plates move across, um, uh, first of all, what do you feel is actually causing that? Is that them coming into this dimension and some type of some type of a EMF effect or some type of effect, as opposed to when plates get thrown across the room? Um, is that so? My question, I guess, is what's the difference between the floating? And why does that happen? And then something that gets thrown or knocked off a shelf and why that happens. That's a good question. In that case, and in most others, uh, that was probably the second most dramatic case. The, the one was a few years later in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, where, you know, really uh, huge armchairs were being thrown across the room, things of that kind, and almost hit me. Uh, would, that would have been not good. But I, I think that the, the throwing and floating, a good, good question. I don't know if these objects are actually being thrown. Uh, in my opinion, having, you know, looking back on it, I think that uh, we were dealing, well, first of all, parasites are multiversal creatures, as we are too, but they, they know how to use it. They will come back and forth, and I really got the impression that in the Bridgeport case that four of these entities were coming and going from somewhere or some when, and I hadn't really developed the idea of the multiverse by then uh, for you for paranormal use, as it were, uh, but it, it made sense after I experienced this. They were coming and going, and there, there seemed to be uh, different energies or forces that accompanied them that were not necessarily intelligent. In other words, I think that when the refrigerator floated, you might have had an overwash from a world, and they'll move between different worlds with different laws of physics. Physicists say, who believe in this, that you have different laws of physics in different worlds. So I think that, that when the energies sort of uh, overwashed with them when they, when they entered our world, that uh, you may have had a world where this refrigerator was very light or weightless even uh, and floated in the presence of me and a couple of for, and a six, six first responders and myself. And uh, that's just one idea. But I never got the impression when anything was, except once, when anything was moving, that there was an entity present. When the entities were present, when they attacked on Monday night, things weren't moving. They were, you know. So I, th- I think that it might be just the, uh, the energies involved uh, when, that, that allowed, that accompany these things when they move back and forth. The, the the metaphor I always use is like when you're if you're running down your hallway and there are a bunch of newspapers or papers on a desk or a table, the wind you stir up is going to knock them off the table. You didn't do it deliberately or personally, but the, the conditions you created when you cross the room uh, let those things move. So I think that, that 
The answer is more or less something like that. And whether it's being thrown or whether it's floating um, is probably incidental depending on, on the kind of energies involved. And that's really the best I can do. Ben, you look like you want to say something. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating the prior question. Oh, okay, considering <laughs> one of the three million words in the English language. Yes, yeah. this word is the word the. Yes. <laughs> Rick, any comments on that? No, I think that's really helpful. That makes a lot of sense because I was always just, just my opinion. Yeah, but, you know, it makes sense because when I was reading about your case and there was a physical attack on you versus – um, and I think it was New Haven where there was a lot of things floating in the room and there was the odor of an ozone or something in it. Yeah, in, in the store beneath the apartment, he, I swore there were bottles of soda floating. And that's one of the reasons they, they called me was because they were uh, so, bottles of soda rising the shelves and hitting customers. <laughs> and the, the, the lady got them the heck out of there before rumors started and she closed the place and, and uh, said they were, they were doing renovations. She even got oh her brother-in-law to park his remodeling truck outside, <laughs> so people would think this little this lady was good, except in dealing with with the, with the parasites because she, she just egged them on and made it all worse. And solved by a joke book. <laughs> solved by the joke book. Yeah, brother Juniper, Peter from <laughs> South uh, South America had asked, "Well, what joke book was it you used to get rid of Republic?" And I said, "You know, nobody's ever asked that before, and I still have it." And I put a picture of it on the uh, Talking Points page for that show. I remember, I read it and I was like, "Wow, this is uh, this is this is this is, this is some dry humor." Well, it was, <laughs> and it was cute. But we yucked it. We had a great time that, and the things were never seen or heard from again. Anyway, so but I, not the usual course I would recommend to deal with public. But anyway, uh, there were, there it was in that case. Not a one size fits all, I suppose. No, no. Uh, and speaking of Peter, here's another question uh, on something uh, rather different. And now for something completely different. Um, Peter writes to us, What is your personal opinion of what a human being being experiences at the moment of death or translation and beyond? Uh, what would your parallel world's version of this event be like? I'm having difficulty visualizing your alternative concept. <laughs> Honest man, Peter. Uh, well, I don't know if he's asking me. Um, I, I this, one of the reasons I look forward to de- to talking with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long today, the expert in near death experiences, is because um, in, in what I we know each other from we're on the board of this institute, and so we've talked in that context. But um, he says that one of the characteristics of a near death experience is a very vivid visual. Uh, experience of something that isn't necessarily present. In other words, uh, when I was having, I guess, what could have been considered a near-death experience, uh, and when I was, uh, I didn't know it, I was quite ill, as it was many years ago, uh, I saw a lizard of tremendous beauty. And I'm not big on lizards and reptiles, but th- th- this was absolutely magnificent. Uh, in a man-made cave, uh, sort of coming out, and... Um, it was incredible. Now that's not the usually people see, you know, tunnels of light and and the Christ or Buddha, or, you know, somebody or or, the, or their ancestor. And I saw this lizard. I don't know, but uh, it was a beautiful experience. And uh, I have been able to duplicate that uh, almost on a daily basis. And uh, th- that sort of visual experience, uh, either um, in a hypnagogic state, you know, coming and going out of sleep, or sometimes just while meditating or things of that kind. And better now you've talked about the, when you were a kid, we were talking about this because you were uh, med- learning to meditate and this sort of thing. And, ah, yes, when yeah. I was five years old. Yes. I remember uh, the days very well. Started you off early on that. So um, it, it's, uh, so I, I, if that's what a near-death experience uh, will produce, one would wonder if the experience of dying uh, is simply... Um, and I really believe that it is, is simply becoming aware of somewhere or somewhen where you're already living a life, parallel life, it's all part of you, and uh, you just continue normally mm. in that. Uh, the, the whole tunnel thing, which is a very common report in near-death experiences, uh, may be simply the, um, the experience of uh, translating to uh, this life you're already living. I mean, I think that that's really... I think the simplicity of that, at least to me, is what might boggle people. So, um, 
I, I think that maybe you know, people have to okay, what happens when you die? Well, maybe nothing happens when you die. You know, maybe you you simply uh, go into this and you make your own bed in the multiverse. And this, in a way, I think is good theology as well. You make your own bed in the multiverse, and it, it can be pretty difficult. And, and a lot of the, some of the fathers of the ancient church said this: it's not easy to go to hell. All right, and what would hell be? It would be something you know, a, a, a place of vast negativity separated from God that you yourself uh, have brought yourself to mm. by having a negative or evil life. I think there, the whole karma thing, I think there's something to that, to say the least. You know, you make your own bed. Uh, and if you are a, as, I, as I've said in some of my books, if you're a selfish jerk in this life, nature nature does what? Takes the path of least resistance. Yes, you, you know, yourself become a monster. Yeah, th- th- then lots and lots of your subconscious lives that you're living in which this is a subconscious life you're a selfish jerk and if you're like uh, you, you know you realize that it's not about me it's about us then you i think you're making a much more comfortable bed in the multiverse so to speak i think it's that simple if that's simple what do you fellas think after you rick uh uh, well, I like your your theory on it. That it makes a lot of sense um, to me. I do believe that there, you know, personally, do I think there's a a, a hell? Uh, yeah, and I also think there's a heaven. But I also, I, the way I think that's interpreted is just the way you said it. You make your bed, you lie in it. When it's time to pass on to the next portion of the multiverse, um, where where you end up um, could be a deeper version of the way you were living. Could be a uh, a worse version of what you were doing, which, God help us, there's been some pretty scary people on this earth. Oh boy, but yeah. it's a pious life, and not that, that you have to live a pious life, but if you do, and you end up more in sort of that line. Um, uh, and that would make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the toughest thing to get, get your mind around is that uh, if these theories are correct, you're, you're already there. You're already living these lives, and, and it, it, it sort of gives seasoning to where you are in the conscious life here. Why aren't we aware of all these lives? Well, we are, in many ways. If we're too aware of them, they say, aha, you're a schizophrenic, and they fill your pockets full of antipsychotic drugs. <laughs> all right. Uh, whereas, and that was the impression I got while working in the, the two psychiatric hospitals as a seminary student. Uh, I wasn't working there uh, for pay. I was visiting them in the, in the capacity of pastoral training and assisting uh, the chaplains at uh, Norwood State Hospital in Connecticut and uh, St. Lawrence State Hospital in upstate New York. Uh, and, and I just got the impression that some of these people who were supposed to be schizophrenic were, were living, in some cases, beautiful parallel lives, very aware of them, and that wasn't considered normal. Others are living in terrible, you know, held places. You know. And uh, so I think that that, that, that sort of um, made me wonder, you know, maybe it's, it was the the, uh, the staff at the hospital and the doctors who were who were sort of, Dummies when it came to reality, and these other people weren't. So, I don't well, know, well, yeah, I'll say, yeah, I agree, completely agree with you. What you say, I, I work with that population, and I, I feel the same way. I That's right, like, you did too. Yeah, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And um, you know what's interesting about that is um, I, I do sense that there is something in these people that has a connection to the multiverse, and in some some people that filter is not complete, and so they're kind of for a person who is living fully here uh, would look at that as what's going on with that person, what's the problem, what's these voices, what are they hearing, what are this. Now, that's not all cases, but I, I do think there's a fair number that, that are, are that way. And when you come to the multiverse and you think about that, you know, when you translate um, and into a life that's already there, and I remember this from the case you had, I think it was, you were meditating and the gentleman was in a plane accident and he had a a broken arm. And oh, he yeah, like, the stone church thing, yeah. And, and my biggest question that ever came out of that was, as he seemed to be translating through your narration of it to a point where he still communicated with you, but you didn't really know what had happened in the basement in the days before. Do you know what I'm alluding to? Yeah, his memory was changing as we spoke. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm thinking there's, as you're translating and you're in that, in his basement of the church and he's figuring it out those memories are now uh changing to the current multiverse situation across all multiverses and would have no recollection of himself prior but he seemed to remember talking with you in some regard 
if I remember it correctly. Yeah. Well, uh, that, uh, folks, uh, that is in my last book, uh, Dancing Past the Graveyard, Parasites, Poltergeists, Parallel Worlds, and God. And uh, if you want to buy it, I'm not going to argue with you. So uh, that's that many other similar stories in there, things I had not wanted to write about because they still make me sound goofy. But you get to a certain age, you don't care what people think. Ben? Mm. Oh, yes. Uh we as humans have the unfortunate ex- of experience of uh, not knowing much at all. Right. Um, we we have we we are not omnip- omnipotent as much as we like to think we are. We're not omnipresent as much as we like to think we are. Um, and we have the great misfortune of only having a subjective experience of an objective reality that is in- informed by um, some sort of outside third party, whatever that may be. Whether it's it's uh, you know, ourselves, a cosmic entity, whatever, what have you, um, and I, I think the ultimate sort of answer to to any question when it comes to um, you know the the afterlife is we we don't know, right? Yeah, and, I mean it could be our, our wonderful station manager here at WO and Dave Richards says he believes that it's uh, going to be a lot simpler. Than people think, and we're all going to kind of sit back and say, "Oh, that's what this is about," you know. And, and he, I think, he, I think this is that simple approach that we take. But others, others may disagree. But, but who knows? I think the, the best thing is to be positive, have hope, have love, and be found doing what you're supposed to be doing when whatever it is finds you. I would also put that into two words: living well. Yes, because loving that's, God, living well. That's all. That's that's all we can do at yeah. the end of the day, right? Exactly. You know, we we do we do have the ability to choose. We make we can make choices. Um, you know whether the outcome of the choices are good or bad. You know it's simply to to exist within a web of relationships that we are all a part of, um, and and kind of participate in in that in this greater story that we're all kind of a part of. And to remember that we're not the main character. Um, we are all we are all. You know, uh, I almost said Walla, but no one would know what that is. We are all extras in there, and you know, no nobody is the main character. You well, know? we may be characters, but not necessarily the main character. Right? Yeah, we're all we're all participating in the same in the same mythology, and it's all happening right now. Well, on that note, let's go to our announcements. Uh, leave people a lot to think about. Yes. So let's get started. On Tuesday, September twenty first, my dad will present a program on UFOs, cryptids, and ghosts. Via Zoom at Mainline Mufon in Philadelphia. You can check that out. Mainline Mufon, M-U-F-O-N dot com. Yeah, that's a virtual event, so anybody can participate. If you live in the uh, Mel- Maldives or somewhere, you can do it. On Friday, October 8th, I'll present a paranormal overview at a somewhat unlikely venue, the Arizona Dowsers Conference at the Little America Hotel in Flagstaff. Visit DowsersSouthwest.com for more information. And people are invited to that. Indeed. And we'll present once again at the Western Connecticut UFO Conference (coughs) during uh, the last weekend of October this year. And uh, that's on Sunday, uh, the 24th. We'll do a live simulcast with the conference. This will be an open line show format with Kathleen Martin taking questions uh, from conference participants and our global audience on the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case, of which... 2021 is the 60th anniversary. Wow. Uh, on the following Saturday, COVID variants permitting, we'll present live at the Danbury, Connecticut Public Library uh, to wrap up all the uh, rest of the conference and other presenters uh, that week will include Mark D'Antonio, Tom Reed, uh, Michael Scrat, Linda Zimmerman, Mike Panicello from uh, Connecticut MUFON as well. So, Rick, what's going on with you? Well, um, we're celebrating birthdays. My son just had his 12th birthday, and I oh, had him hmm. wondering. 22 in NASCAR, his favorite driver, Joey Logano, will be rooting for him this year in the Cup Series coming up. Um, then I'm hopefully coming to in October to see Cousin Paul present in Arizona, so I'm looking forward to that. That'd be cool. We've got to talk about that because there's more going on than you think. Okay, so, <laughs> so you'll be excited. Um, okay, after years of tech problems, all regular... Uh, radio broadcasts of Behind the Paranormal from CBS, Achieve Radio, and here on WOON uh, have been restored in the archives at BehindTheParanormal.com. In addition, our show has its own app now. Check it out. Uh, you can go to BehindTheParanormal.com and download it. 
uh, right there. Uh, it's still not available in the uh, Google and Apple stores, but it will be hopefully soon. And uh, it'll, uh, it's as I say, it's bare bones, but it'll give you all the uh, the past. Uh, uh, recent past shows. Indeed, and you can check out all our books along with those of our guest co-hosts at our show website, BehindTheParanormal.com, uh, where you can also find out more about the show, our many cases over the years, our public appearances, and how to book us along with uh, some some of those 900-plus free recorded shows now restored, as my dad mentioned earlier. So what's, what do we have next week, Ben? Well, uh, we, we have Cooking Up in the Oven uh, next week, September 5th. Uh, we will bring you Cheryl and Linda Costa who have assembled a tremendous amount of actual data on UFOs. That, that's valuable because you'd be surprised how, you know, how little data people assemble when they allegedly uh, check these things out. Anyway, we'll leave you today with a pithy thought from the Irish poet and playwright, playwright Oscar Wilde, who certainly lived up to his last name. To live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist. That is all. I'm Paul Eno. And I'm Ben Eno. And I'm Rick Eno. Thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey, and we'll see you next time on Behind the Paranormal. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.